Hi, this is Daria Piano and welcome to another video in my Fundamentals of Piano Playing series. And this video is probably the most important one. Wrist is really the core component of our pianistic anatomy for multiple reasons. One, purely anatomically, it connects our fingers, which perform the smaller muscle function, with a larger movements of our forearm, our elbow, and our shoulder. And it's like a middleman that connects these and makes them become one and function organically as one organism. And by achieving that organic uh, quality, you get that plasticity that I've mentioned in the first video of the series. The plasticity of sound, the plasticity of phrasing and musical lines that you are shaping on the piano when you play. And the second thing is it really dictates, it shapes our pianistic movements to the core. It can unify our finger movement and it leads the movement of our forearm and, and uh, elbow too, because this is you're leading with that, right? And understanding this function of the wrist from the very, very beginning is essential. It cannot be overemphasized, really, and should never be neglected. So when you start your pianistic journey, your learning, one needs to establish a very clear and diverse and purposeful vocabulary of these wrist movements in order to master pianistic technique at any level and knowing what to do with your wrist at any point can become a clue to solving any technical issue that you're experiencing it's really a key to master any type of pianistic technique really and i'm not exaggerating wrist is like the most important uh thing to discuss it's a very integral part of our pianistic anatomy, our pianistic apparatus. So, and to even take it further <laughs> to, on the importance of wrist, um, just wanted to uh, cite Chopin. This is a book uh, that is titled How to Play Chopin and it's in Russian, so I'm gonna roughly translate. This book is actually great. If some of you are Russian speakers, you can purchase that. It's a masterclass, so-called masterclass book. Uh, it's a collection of essays by different people. Some of them are Chopin's contemporaries, such as Liszt, for example. If you didn't know, Liszt wrote a whole book on Chopin, Franz Liszt, who was also a fabulous composer, musician of his time. Uh, very interesting book. I would definitely recommend you reading One Genius Writing About Another. That's already fascinating. And uh, the book itself is beautifully written and it tells you a lot about Chopin as well and his character. So I digressed a bit, sorry. So this book is a collection of different essays and some of them are written uh, by, uh, by his contemporaries. Some of them are written by the 20th century musicians, pianists. So this uh, chapter I'm gonna read from is from Victor Nikolai. And there's uh, some words about Chopin and a quote from Chopin. So Victor Nikolai says, that Chopin entrusted the live breath of music into his hands, hands literally here. And then there is a quote that is attributed to Chopin. The movements of the hand joint, I'm assuming he refers to the wrist hand joint here, while playing the piano can be clearly compared to the intervals of breathing while singing. And then later in the book, there is also another quote where Chopin thought of wrists moving as breathing, really. And, with, and then later Nikolaev says, with one unifying gesture of the hand, as if on one breath, he, Chopin, connected elements of phrases, shorter motifs, and a lot of notes in the positional chains of passages. While playing a longer singing line, he put a huge emphasis on the purposeful nature of the hand movements. And by doing so, he renewed the breath of music in such a way where it never interrupted the natural flow of the phrasing in any awkward spots. So I hope that just uh, 
shows to you how important it is for us musicians, pianists, to understand how we use our um, body, our pianistic apparatus, and specifically wrist. So now I'm going to mention to you, just I'm going to list and explain briefly the four main types of wrist movements. And then I will illustrate on the piano. I will show you some examples and we'll do a little quiz of different types of wrist movements and see if you can recognize them. First type of wrist movement, a simple movement that's down up. And it is really this essential movement that we use every time we press a key, we go down. It's like inhale and up, exhale, down, up. But the most important thing here is the continuity. It's like a wave where you have an impulse here and this is a response, an uh, antecedent consequence. You should think of it as one rather than two. One down, one up. This is kind of one gesture. It should naturally be up. It should be natural continuation of down. And when you go up, it's important to not do this. Not fingers up. It's up like this, right? So you're exhaling naturally. And that continuity is like breathing. We don't breathe as... That's stopping all the time. It's like very segmental, right? We don't do that. We continuously breathe in such a way where we don't even notice where our, our exhale and inhale happens, right? Unless we consciously pay attention. So this is something that we need to integrate in our pianistic movements, a very, very basic movement down up. That's number one. Number two is a sideways movement, which is simply either to the right or to the left. So how the wrist goes right, left. And this movement is used all the time when we want to extend beyond a position that requires just one note per finger, right? If we need to slightly go more, we will lead with the wrist depending on which direction we're going to go. So when we play scales, when we play arpeggios, when we play any type of a long passage or an extended position, we need to lead with the wrist in order to achieve that plasticity because otherwise we'll be like this stuck in it and then that will be tension and we have to continue remaining in their alignment. Alignment is another topic, but that's a sideways movement. Third movement is rotation. And rotation is also very, very important to understand because it can really alleviate a lot of efforts that fingers are making by simply giving that to the wrist without losing any control of the key without losing the nature of the sound that you need to get. So that movement I would probably describe best as a turning a doorknob, but not really 180, but just slightly. So this type of movement, and it should be very, very natural. So let's say if we wanted to play some um, tremolo, right? We would, if we just do it with the fingers like this, I'll show it later on the piano. But this, this is a lot of movement for the finger. It's quite tiring. But if I do that simply by rotating my wrist, I can do it all day because it's very, very natural and it's barely any effort for the wrist. It's like just really, really quick, right? Uh, very commonly used with classical sonata accompaniment type of Alberti bass where you have something like this or something like this. Very commonly, you just basically alleviate all the pressure from the fingers that don't have to overwork just by including that as your directing movement. And movement number four, uh, last but not least, is a circular motion. Circular motion is, in a way, a combination of down, up, and sideways. However, circular movement, easiest to probably show like this. So if you put one finger down and just draw circles with your wrist, right? All the way up, all the way down, up, down. very, very flexible, very flexible, plastic. And this is the circular movement. Why is it a combination of up and down and sideways? Look, down, then slightly sideways, and then right, then left, up. But the only difference is that here we don't really lift fully at all. We don't fully release the key, we, but we have to go down again. So we have to go back to the position of down. So that there is our circle. It's completed after we go down again. So we're not allowing ourselves to go fully up. We just go almost release and down. So this is how 
we can play a lot of long passages, especially repetitive ones in etudes, for example, where we have, we are using the same figuration over and over, it's repeated from different keys, and we, are doing, we have to do all of it legato as one long line. But we need to breathe, we can't, otherwise it's like playing on one breath as a <gasps> We can't do it, right? We need to pace ourselves really well. And I can actually describe that, maybe do an analogy with swimming. So if you swim, if you don't establish a breathing pattern for yourself, if you're going to breathe randomly, it's like, okay, I'm going to do as many strokes as I can on one breath and <gasps> quick breathe. And then I don't know how long I will last the next until I need to breathe again, right? We, this is very ineffective. We don't know how to pace ourselves. We don't know how far we're going to make it and when we're going to get tired. But if we pace ourselves, okay, I'll breathe every three strokes. And this is a clear pacing and we know what to expect. We are controlling it. Same thing here. So when I play a, a passage that includes a lot of repetitive elements, I'm going to pace my breathing by every time I have an element, I'm going to conclude it with exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. And this is what's going to allow me to last for a long time. It's like just swimming a long distance. I'm controlling my breath. So, Another important thing about any of these movements, you can see them on macro scale, like I was just showing you now, it's, it's, it's a very evident circle. But we don't always need to show that much. Sometimes it's very tiny. Look, for example, I'm gonna do a big one and then we're gonna get smaller and smaller. You can see this, this is very big, huge circle, right? Huge circle, then I'm gonna get slightly smaller, slightly smaller, slightly smaller. It's tiny, right? I'm going to do a close up later, but it's tiny. I'm still doing it. It's still circular movement. So micro level is very useful in fast passages where we don't have a lot of time to do a huge movement, but we still need that movement to breathe, right? Otherwise we're going to suffocate. You will be surprised here. Actually, I will show you some examples where it seems like just one seamless but in fact, there are so many different <laughs> micro movements that go into that movement that are not noticeable just because they were so tiny, but they're still there and they have to be there. Without them, you will have tension and you will not be able to play for a long time. And also there are combinations of these as well. They are just not only used in isolation. Oftentimes we use a combination of two or three of them. And I will show, they'll demonstrate they, that to you with some examples. Thank you for watching and supporting my channel. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.